Um, your background is in journalism, I believe. Um, can you just talk about the kind of transition to, to filmmaking and what it was about this topic that you thought would translate so well to the screen? Well, uh, as a journalist, I kind of actually specialized in um, sort of first-person personal articles. Um, I wore a wig for, or a toupee for New York Magazine, which is an article you can actually look up online if you like. Um, I did like a body depilation thing with like honey. Um, so it was always a part of my journalism, or it was a big part of my journalism to kind of do personal stories. So in a, in a way, this story was a natural extension of what I had been doing. I think what I needed to learn as a filmmaker, and it's still, you know, uh, want to learn more about is telling a story, story visually. Uh, my experience was you just need to go out and get the quotes, um, and you can, you know, it doesn't matter how they say them, but when you film somebody, they need to, to speak in a way that really leaps off the, off the editing bay and, and will connect with the audience. Can you talk about the evolution of film, and where did that first moment of inspiration come from? The inspiration truly came from that Fire Island uh, train ride. I really, I really just suddenly had like kind of a weird meteor shower in my head, um, where I just was just overwhelmed by that feeling of, of sort of hating myself, not knowing why, not wanting to hate myself, not knowing what to do about it. And I think what really solidified the project for me was that uh, young man that you meet at the beginning who says, you know, I hate sounding gay. Couldn't get a boyfriend because I sounded gay. I couldn't get a job. And if I could press a button, I would prefer not to sound gay. And that was really shocking to me. And I actually had never talked to any of my gay friends uh, about this. My friend Sam, who's in the film, um, I don't think he says it in the film, but um, he struggled with it his whole life. And we're be you know, best friends, and we never talked about it. So the further I went, the more I felt compelled to just try to get through to the end. I mean, the, the basic idea of the film seems so simple, but it is something that felt really fresh to me while I was watching it. Why do you think this is a subject that isn't really spoken about within the gay community? I don't know. I think maybe there's a larger subject about effeminacy that we don't talk about in general, and, and this is a symbol of that subject. Um, uh, you know, I think many of us were and are sort of somewhat victimized or traumatized for not fitting in to kind of a typical gender spectrum. And so the voice was a way into that conversation for me. I think the, the film goes on, you go on quite a journey throughout the film. And I think what comes off at the start of possibly seeming like there's some kind of self-hatred going on becomes actually a really positive story and a really life-affirming story by the end. Were you surprised by that journey that you went on? I was. I, I didn't really know how it was going to end myself. And there, you know, um, uh, I think a lot of us still struggle with homophobia to a, internalized homophobia to a lesser or greater degree. And, and if, if we don't, that's absolutely wonderful. Um, but uh, yeah, I felt like I needed to try to go on that journey. And honestly, I wasn't sure that I would become more comfortable with myself. I really, I really thought that, um, changing my voice might be some kind of magic bullet. And I, I think it was easier to obsess over my voice than to you know, attempt to dismantle kind of the psychology of, of the questions that I was asking. But clearly, at the same time, I was trying to you know, be who I was. And um, uh, so that's my answer. I do think the media has played a huge role. Uh, you have Don Lemon in the film who says, you know, I used to sound Southern, and I used to sound black, but I wanted to be a newscaster, so I, I changed my voice, and now my, my family thinks I sound white. And there's absolutely a kind of standard voice and a standard gender that uh, the media collectively reflects back to us as, as being normal. Um, and you guys would know better than I would, but I think that I heard something about how the BBC or radio maybe started having uh, presenters who didn't all have a certain kind of accent. Does that, is that true? Yeah. And I thought that was really exciting and cool that, you know, there's this starting to reflect back a somewhat more diverse um, uh, set of voices because voices are metaphors or they are stand-ins for kind of who we are and where we come from. You know, uh, it's all about gender. So, of course, there is a lesbian voice. There's like a butch, uh, 
you know, woman kind of voice. I, I did speak to a lot of women for the film and looked into the research, and there, there is linguistic research on, you know, women sounding more like, uh, lesbian women sounding more like men, and, and that is exactly, it doesn't mean you are a lesbian, but the more masculine you sound, the more gay somebody might perceive you. Um, but it's not a big stigma in the US specifically. Um, and my, one of my favorite examples of this is um, Rachel Maddow is one of our newscasters, and I think some of you might know her. She's on MSNBC, and she's very butch, and I think you could at fairly describe her as sounding like a lesbian, um, and she's very popular. Um, but we have no equivalent of like an effeminate news presenter, nor will we probably have one ever. And I think there's a difference between you know, that taking on a kind of authoritative masculine voice um, versus taking on a feminine voice. Now, of course, there's lots of other things about being a lesbian that are stigmatized, so that is not to say that, you know, you've got it easy. <laughs> Thank you. It took um, three and a half to four years. I wish it took longer because it would sound more impressive. Um, some documentaries take like 12 years or 20 years and like, wow. Um, yes, so, and I do have other film projects in mind. Uh, but, uh, and I'll keep you posted, www.doisoundgay.com. <laughs> so, you know, you can't go into any amount of science in a film for, for too long without boring the crap out of people. So, um, you know, I wish I could have gone into a bit more, but the fact is that when you're young, you imitate the speech sounds of the person you identify with. Um, so in all likelihood, you had more identification with your mom um, or some women in your life, your sisters or your friends, and he had more identification at some point in his language formation with his, your father or brothers or men in his life. And that's in the film you have the linguist who says, you know, I, I have a brother, he sounds straight, I sound gay. I hung around with my mother, my brother hang around, hung around with my father. So I don't know if that's true in your case. If it's not, don't, don't tell anyone. Um, <laughs> and, and of course, these are all theories. It's all theoretical. This is not um, a branch of science that people are throwing money at. So it's, it's a recent field of study. <laughs> there aren't very many studies. So it, again, it's all theoretical, and you can take it with a grain of salt, reject it entirely, or swallow it whole. I, I was trying on these different roles and looking for these different gay voices I felt as I was developing as a gay man because I, I didn't know anyone gay growing up and I didn't know how I was supposed to be so I took on different roles that seemed to be available to me and I, I felt like I came as close as I'm ever going to come to playing the role that is me. That's a, a great question as like a follow-up to that question um, because um, I speak French and I don't seem to sound gay when I speak French. Um, and part, I think part of that is role-playing and code switching and I think in, in for, <laughs> oh, what's that? Um, so I don't know. Um, you know, there are, sounding gay exists in every language in theory because it's whatever sounds effeminate. Um, but I did interview people who spoke multiple languages and they would say, you know, I don't sound gay in Greek, but I think in London, you know, I camp it up. And it sort of depends on who you're with. As yeah, you guys saw, I did some man on the street stuff here. Um, just before we finish, I'm just interested to know, obviously you have some really amazing people featured in the film talking about themselves. Was there anyone that you approached that didn't want to be part of the project or was actually surprised to be asked? There were a number of people who said no. Um, I don't really want to name them. Um, Go on. <laughs> I'll tell you later. Um, I, there were a lot of people who said no. A lot of times people say, oh, you've got such amazing people. And I, they don't know that I've rejected by many, many more people than are actually in the film. Um, but I think that I got a, well, I was lucky to get a really interesting kind of clutch of people who are all sort of different and interesting kind of in their own way.